Hello, and welcome to the 7th Annual Bay Area Book Festival. So tonight's program is called Interior Chinatown, Tinseltown and Other Worlds Imagined. Charles Yu on showbiz and storytelling with Lodge 49's Jim Gavin. Um, We are thrilled to have Charles Yu with us tonight. He's one of the most original and audaciously creative novelists working today. His four books, among them How to Live Safely in a Science Fiction Universe and Interior Chinatown, which won the 2020 National Book Award in Fiction, um, are known for, they're as known for their hilarity and heart as much as for their genre bending stylistic innovations, which you will hear more about tonight. Um, he is a veteran TV writer and has been nominated for two Writers Guild of America awards for his work on the HBO series Westworld. Um, he also was part of the Writers Room for season one of the AMC cult classic series Lodge 49 which is how he met his partner in conversation tonight. Um, That is Jim Gavin, tonight's moderator. He first burst onto the literary scene with a heartbreaking and funny short story, Costello, which was maybe the only tale about grief, SoCal and plumbing salesman ever to have appeared in the New Yorker. Costello was included in Jim's critically acclaimed short story collection, Middlemen. The stories explored themes like the vanishing of the middle class and the collision between dreams and grim reality, topics that were also brought to life in the TV series that Jim created for AMC, Lodge 49, which aired from 2018 to 19 and guest starred Paul Giamatti and Counts Patton Oswalt and Tom Hanks among its fans. So take it away, Jim, and uh, enjoy the conversation. Uh, thank you, Sherilyn. Um, I'm Jim Gavin. I'm thrilled to be talking with uh, Charles Yu. Um, I guess to start, you should know that I'm a very uh, petty, vindictive little man. Um, and usually when other people win major awards, I'm, I'm filled with uh, rage and, and jealousy. Um, but uh With Charlie, it was different. I was cackling with delight and um, so well-deserved. And I should tell you what a great writer and great person uh, Mr. Yu is. So um, I'm very happy to be doing this. Um, Charlie, I can't see you. There you go. Okay. Um, Yeah. uh, so <laughs> this is kind of <laughs> surreal. It's really <laughs> surreal. Um, it is. We have so Thanks. many hours just kind of staring at the ceiling together. Um, <laughs> and uh, I like thinking that while we were trying to figure out how to make a parasite come out of someone's nose, you were off in the evenings writing a book <laughs> that's going to win the National Book Award. So well done to you. Well done. Um <laughs> Jim. But uh, I was a fan of Charlie before I got to work with them. Um, these books are utterly unique and um, they're just, I, I have the great joy of knowing Charlie. So they, for me, they are just, they're just Charlie in book form, um, which is, I, it's hard to say, but for me, that's what, if I can give a compliment, it's that it's just that the, the, it's the voice is, is both, uh, consistent throughout, but also totally changing throughout. So, um, anyway, Charlie, good to see you, my man. Um, uh, yes, I had some ideas where this could go, but, um, we'll just try and find our way. Um, yeah. Uh, but I'll start with, uh, interior Chinatown, um, which I just can't recommend enough. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to talk about and you know, the, one of the things I've always loved about your writing is that I, I just feel like it's a pure comic voice. Um, and for me, that doesn't mean less serious. In fact, I, you know, I, I think it can often be way more serious and have a weightier feel. And so for me, one of the satisfactions of you of, of getting this wonderful recognition is that it was also recognition for comic writers <laughs> Um and because I, you know, this is a book that has makes me laugh out loud, um, but is also just 
there are so many gut punches and you seem to do it within scenes. Um, in particular, I think the, uh, when you read the book, no spoilers, but, uh, the, uh, courtroom scene <laughs> at the end, like where, where, we, where you take us and where it ends, like it's, there just seems there's so much going on. Um, but I'm curious your thought, your thoughts on that. Like, um, how you how you get into a piece is it you know or you have you talk about weighty things but you do it in this like very accessible way that i find comic so i'm just kind of curious how you do about well thanks jim uh i am uh it's it's strange to be talking to you in a context in which uh you're not my boss um you know, <laughs> that my continued employment depends on impressing you, I, I guess. Uh, so this is nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you were, you know, you were really nice as bosses go. You were an excellent boss. So if anyone's thinking of working for Jim Gavin, I highly recommend it. Uh, he's an, not just an incredible writer, but uh, very generous as an employer uh financially i mean just financially you're well uh, that was that was the first time <laughs> first time in my life i was in charge of anything ever um so uh <laughs> so well, thank it, you it turned out pretty great uh i'm wearing my my shirt by the way and uh, you can't um, it didn't work out because the pocket is below <laughs> yeah for the phone, I, I can get you which one do you have i have i have i don't know okay I, Okay, you have the brew. Okay, okay. Good. I can <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. I, I, um, I, I don't know. I mean, that's a high compliment coming from you because I, I laughed out loud a lot reading Middleman. I laugh out loud watching Lodge. I mean, not the the season I wasn't on. I, I think it's incredibly brilliant and funny. Um, I. I don't, I don't think I'm funny. My family doesn't think I'm funny. You know, like none of my friends think I'm funny. I think, uh, I, I guess, and I don't know that it's funny. I think you're right to say comic. I guess it's, that's where it starts for me is that it's comic, a comic sensibility in that I'm, my characters try not to take themselves very seriously. They're, you know, they're not quite fools, but they're often, not exactly heroes. Um, and they're just sort of, you know, staring at their shoes or a little awkward. And that's, that's sort of, and now my dog decided to join the conversation. That's, uh, that's, that's sort of the key that I, you know, find, you know, the, yeah. I, I try other registers and they don't work out for me. And I always sort of end up in this mumbly guy kind of register <laughs> <laughs> um well yeah well that's another so i mean you have a a brother who is a comic actor and writer yeah and is he considered the funny one in the family is that the <laughs> general consensus yeah when we were little he would entertain everybody um and yeah and then people would sort of look at me you know, like was, you know, I mean, I guess I was sort of the, you know, the one who studied hard. I, he studied hard, too. I don't know. Yeah, he was the entertaining one, for sure. He was in drama. So it, it is odd to actually have ended up sort of having the same job. Um, yeah. That's very weird. Uh, and, yeah, I, I guess I was around, you know, I was around somebody who was, the center of attention often yeah that was a little you know that's where i'm comfortable though you know like yeah. i mean like in the lodge writer's room i was you know I, I i was just watching all of you funny people say funny stuff and then i would try to try to internalize it it, it, it it's weird to be in a writer's room where it feels like you're supposed to talk they're paying you to talk but sometimes yeah, i yeah. just want to sit and think for a long time yeah i mean it's strange i mean you and i both had other careers and did most of our writing solo so it was very new to me to be 
collaborating with people who were very comfortable in that environment. And um, yeah, I think luckily we just a lovely group of people. So that helps a lot. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I think when I think of like comic, right. Like, I mean, when I say that I, it, it's like, I don't mean like one liners and, and jokes. It's more, it is yeah, kind of the sensibility of uh, just almost the opposite of tragedy in the sense that bad things still happen and there's still pain. It's just an attitude towards it. That's different. And sometimes that's through um, you know, your stuff. Like it's, it's refracted often through just absurdity, like the absurdity of the universe and the, the malleability of it. Um, uh, were you, have you, were you always drawn to writers that could, that kind of delve into the absurd or um, yeah, or, or just comic stories in general? I, I think so. I mean, yeah, I, I guess. Cart starting from cartoons, yeah. <laughs> you know, like the first metafiction that I encountered was Bugs Bunny breaking the fourth wall. You know, <laughs> like the, the, that's where the absurdity starts, and yeah. then maybe a lot like a diet of American sitcoms. I think we're roughly you and I are I think the same age. Yeah. Like I probably watched you know five thousand hours of Three's Company. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that live to tell the tale. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, not exactly absurd, but so, sort of. I mean, the sort of contrivance of the setup is so, and, and then the, the kind of pattern of it. So I guess I'm drawn to, I, I don't know, I guess, yeah, between cartoons and a lot of TV watching. And then, I mean, as I read, I didn't have any, like, I, I didn't major in English. I probably am like woefully like under read for like actual literature. <laughs> but um, uh, I think I did find myself drawn to things that had sort of out there premises. For yeah. Whatever. Well, that's, that's interesting because one of the things I've always felt in your writing is I, that I like envy, I think is there's a, there, there's a sense of freedom to it. Like that you are just kind of smashing kind of, a lot aside to like get to the heart of things um uh both your novels like do that kind of instantly um uh what did you study in college i well i went to berkeley so mm -hmm. go bay area um book festival uh my actually cal my my alma mater tweeted about this event which was very exciting i think it's the first time berkeley <laughs> ever tweeted uh uh anyway i studied um biology there specifically oh. biochemistry which okay just something like just uh... and then then obviously you made this the the jump to law school from biochemistry or um <laughs> uh, traditional tv writer path yeah yeah so um can you tell me about that leap is was that did yeah. you go was there, did you work in the sciences before law or did you kind of just decide I, I'm going to make a big change and go do it? Well, no, I didn't. I tried to, I worked, I worked in a lab in college and then I'm trying to look at the green dot. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. <laughs> it's impossible. Sorry. Uh, it, it really is. Uh, I worked in a lab as an undergrad um, and did research on bacteria Mm -hmm. uh, which meant like sp spreading strains of bacteria on plates of um, agar, you know, the food that they eat and then <laughs> cooking it for a couple of days and looking at, so that was the extent of my science work. And then yeah. I was not a cutting edge scientist. And uh, um, then I applied to medical school and I didn't get in. Uh -huh. So uh, the, the plan then was basically, Oh, law school. Uh, I just, I hatched it. <laughs> uh, when I realized, oh, all I have to do is take the LSAT and um, then I get to read and write for another few years, you know, basically defer adulthood. Yeah. So that was, that was really a decision. And uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> so in the midst of all that, just to continue down, were you, were there, was there a secret plan to be like you wanted to write and, or was this almost like you were kind of avoiding the actual facing the fact that you wanted to write or um, like as when you were a practice, you were a practicing lawyer. Like were you is, when did you start writing seriously then? I, I wrote, I wrote, I did write poetry in college. I was a creative writing minor. So Berkeley had that. I don't know if they have a major now. I don't, I don't think so, but they had a minor. I, I did it, which meant I took like half a dozen poetry workshops and, um, and so, yeah, I wrote, I wrote poems pretty much all through college. I, you know, toyed around with the idea of applying to MFA programs. I never did. I think I applied for the Stegner fellowship. Um, and I didn't get it. And, and, uh, so I gave that up pretty quick. I mean, I actually never wrote another poem after my last semester, I just stopped <laughs> writing poetry. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't read that much fiction in college and in, uh, in law school. Yeah. When, in, I mean, I was reading a lot of other stuff. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, well, there was no like secret plan. I mean, I guess I dreamed about it, but I didn't know what that meant, you know? Yeah. I, I had, you know, I remember like I'd go to Cody's or Moe's on Telegraph and buy like the Paris review or like, you know, or just flip through it really. Cause yeah. it's expensive. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes I'd buy a literary magazine often. I would just read them because they had great selections of them. And so I guess I dreamed about being in one of those magazines someday. Mm -hmm. So, and you started with sh short stories or did you kind of leap into a novel? Uh, short stories. Yeah. So after law school, I started writing them and sending them out to i don't know did you do the same did you just start like cold submitting to places or did you already know people through uh yeah i mean i i guess like in my yeah kind of late 20s early 30s i when i started taking writing a little more seriously i i tried you know yeah i was working on stories um um i still have not completed a novel although hopefully at some point um it's only seven years past deadline so i have plenty of time <laughs> are you under contract for an outfit can i if i'm allowed to ask uh yes i am yes interior chinatown at one point was close to seven years over it would have been had they not amended it so you have you're in good company <laughs> that warms my heart this is all worthwhile just for that. So thank you. Um, you you did write a novel, Jim. You wrote, I think, Lodge 49 is one of the better novels of recent years, <laughs> if, if I may. Like, well, it'd be great it. if I could get all you guys to come help me write my actual novel like, like a <laughs> show, because that, that worked out pretty well. Um, uh, yes. Um, to get back to Interior China, uh, interior Chinatown, um, one thing I wanted to ask is I think um, some some novels just have a title that's so perfect. It just like your brain just kind of, it just does something to your brain where it feels like this could be the, this is the only title it could ever be. And <laughs> this feels like that because um, it, I mean, it just every, I think I mentioned like the the further you go into the novel, the more perfect it becomes. And I, I had maybe had some hunch or intuition that the novel may, or the, the title itself may have come to you fairly early and, and just kind of the power of titles and kind of writing. I don't know. It's something I'm, this is just kind of like a tinkering writer question. Like what is your, because what is your relationship to the, to type, to this title and titles in general? Um, Cause they, they do form some kind of uh, like roadmap and, uh, key to unlocking something so random question but no i love that i mean i think i i think again not to i i promise i'm not going to keep reflexively spitting it back at you but i feel like lodge 49 is a title like that too where i don't know how early or not it came in but it feels like something where one it continues to reveal itself 
as she watched the thing. I mean, and, um, and I'm guessing that it felt incredibly good to be like, Oh wow. All of this is folding in. That, that is how it felt with interior Chinatown. It felt yeah. like almost like, um, and this, I'm not saying this, it sounds like a weird brag, but it's really just that a, a rare occurrence where a happy accident happens and you're, and I'm thinking, could it really be that, you know, it almost feels like it dropped out of the sky. You know, yeah. like I didn't really come up with that. It just fell out of somewhere uh, yeah. because it, it, it hit so many of the things I was trying to do. And it almost felt like a little too on the nose for a while. I, I, I had it titled interior golden palace. Um, and I think for a lot of reasons, it was never going to be that, but I wanted to believe that it could be that, um, yeah. I knew once I put interior Chinatown anywhere in the book, it would probably never switch back to something else. So for a while, I, was, I didn't tell my editor. I was like, I just wrote interior golden palace everywhere, but I just kept coming back to it. And I thought, well, it is yeah. more resonant, I suppose. And, and yeah, for me titles, um, you, you know, I love flipping through a collection and seeing titles that are immediately evocative or cryptic or, you know, I, I, they're, they're like paratext, but they're, they can interact with the, with the text, both in the writing and as the reader, I think yeah. right? they're, they're, a, they're like a weird ancillary thing that, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, is that how they've, do do you find time just like writing titles down or enjoying it? Um, I I generally had the experience, especially with short stories, of um, uh, I've had both. I think, um, yeah, Mark, Martin Amos said something like a title is either like there at the right, very, at the very beginning that just, or it's kind of been lurking at the edges all along, and then you find it, and then it could only be be that and i've had that experience a couple times but when it like uh it's really satisfying when because suddenly i i've had the experience where i suddenly see the story because of the title um and that's that does it does have that feeling of like coming out of it's coming out of the air um uh but yeah no i just there was something i remember the first time i just saw what it was your book was called i just like it's like this is amazing like because i it just it has just one of those so um so yes um uh other things um you know just talking about your your work in general and the kind of <laughs> the outrageous ways like journeys and detours you'll take to kind of get to these really fundamental stories. Um, and one, one thing I just feel at the heart is, uh, the relationship of, uh, uh, son and father, son and mother, basically that basically a relationship with parents and a reckoning with, uh, parents. And, you know, I, as I mentioned to you, I feel like, I don't know if writers in particular have a moment where they they become obsessed with um, their parents' past before they were their parents. Before, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, I don't know what point in life you suddenly see your parents as like human beings who had a life before you. Um, but I ask this, or I want to talk about this because it's something I'm, I reckon with a lot and trying that I can't really. It feels inescapable. Like I, um, but I, you know, I think in in both your novels and in. in interior of Chinatown in particular, there's this uh, both obsession to know the parent as separate from son and also reckoning with becoming like an interior of Chinatown, becoming a, a, a father themselves, you know? So like, um, is that something that you set out to write about or is it kind of an inevitable thing? Is it, a, is it a, just a percolating thing always? Yeah, I think it's the it's the latter for me. Yeah. I, it's always percolating; can't really get away from it. You know, as a subject, um, mm -hmm. 
I'm trying to think. Um, sometimes I, I, you know, I start with um, something that feels like it's going to, like, how will this turn into a family story? Mm -hmm. It eventually just sort of migrates. It doesn't get interesting until, for whatever reason, I can get it to some kind of yeah. parent child relationship. Yeah. Um, and you, you know, specifically, I think the the what you're talking about this um, uh, idea of the parents in that some kind of yeah era that feels almost like impossible to access. So maybe that's why it's like the a kind of mythical time of uh, or period of the parents' life of when they were. And, and maybe this is a sort of I don't know as I like as I, I don't know that I have yet, but like if I used to write sort of like a younger guy's novel and now I'm like writing a middle-aged dad's novel from now. And then by the time I finish another one, it'll be like a grandparent's novel probably. And so yeah. I don't know, you know, but I feel like maybe there's something about being a certain age and, you know, just realizing there's like, I, you know, in my thirties, when I was writing in how to live safely, for instance, like just coming to that age of, Oh, I'm pretty old already. And yet, you know, and, and so m my dad and mom were younger than I, I was when they did X, Y, and Z. And just thinking about yeah. it, just, I, I don't, you know, that that's, um, yeah, I thought it was building to a kind of epiphany there, but there was none. Um, <laughs> You know, an anti-epiphany can be just as effective. Um, so, I hope so. Um, uh, yeah, no, that all that all is very familiar. I think our our parents stamp a clock on our lives that we uh, if, if we have to do this by this time or something. If, if not, something's gone wrong, um, which is not true, obviously. But uh, yeah, I think. I, I don't know. I, I have an, uh, this impulse for whatever reason to like kind of memorialize like my family or kind of like valorize them for just being just, you know, fairly decent, normal people. I don't know. I don't know where that, that comes from, but it, but I, I think I, behind that is also like, you know, were they really happy? what was really going on? You know, um, what did they sacrifice? What did, uh, you know, and so, yeah, I mean, I, something I'm working on is set, you know, and my, when my parents were young, you know, so, um, yeah, it's just been on my mind a lot. So, um, yeah. Um, uh, this, <laughs> Yeah. Can I can I say one more thing in that though? Yeah, uh, yeah. Please. May may or not be may or may not be interesting to everyone else, but it is to me <laughs> because you and I are the same age, basically, and grew up like not too far from each other in Southern California. Yeah. Um, and I I it, I wonder if there's both something like I think a lot of things we're talking about are somewhat universally relatable. I think, but the what if there's something also specifically like geographic and time temporal about growing up in Southern California in the eighties and nineties, like, was it yeah. a magical time or are we just the kinds of guys who want to mythologize those golden years of like, yeah. I don't know, you know, like maybe both. I don't know. Uh, well, I think, I think there's something to that. I think I know personally I've had kind of uncanny moments of being, in a particular part of LA or Long Beach or Orange County where it's something about the sunlight and the type of building, maybe something built like post-war that just for a moment, I feel like time slips a little bit. Hmm. And I feel like I'm looking at what my parents might've looked at in the sixties or something or in that. And those moments really stop me. And, and it does feel, I'm sure everyone has that, but, it's peculiar to a certain feeling in California that 
um, that kind of sense of the future in California that everything was oriented to the future. Everything, you know, like um, everything was going to be better and there was all this growth and everything. Um, and as kids in the eighties, I think we still kind of have that. We're, I, I felt that a little bit. I mean, I, I remember, none of my parents went to college where they could afford a, a home. And I don't know if maybe some of this looking back is because we feel that future has gone away a little bit mm. or that sense of it. Um, mm. But it, it's specifically in a Southern California context, you're saying, because you're, um, oh, I mean, we talked about this when we were in the room, but your, your father worked in aerospace, correct? Yeah, he did in at McDonnell Douglas and Boeing. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I came in to meet with you and Peter Ako after the, I had read your pilot and I, I think I told you, I was just trying to get the job at that point, but I, it was true. I was not flattering <laughs> you um, that you had really nailed something that I couldn't put my finger on. Like I, you know, felt that thing, you know, certain paintings with that quality of light, you know, that, you know, are from Europe 500 years ago, but something about the way you wrote about Southern California really captured, you know, just like, like you said, walking in or into certain buildings or the feeling just like the sensory, but also this almost like metaphysical thing that goes on. And, and maybe it's everywhere. Maybe it's not just yeah. Southern California, but, um, uh, you know, and you wrote about it in Middlemen too, I think a lot, right? I, I feel like some of the same yeah. images and, and sensations were there already in your work. And so, yeah, capturing that, I, I think this, uh, I'm trying to bring it back to your question about parents. I don't know. It is weird why that is a subject that I just, I mean, four books in, yeah. I'm still sort of circling it. I don't know that yeah. I'm going to get away from it, you know? Yeah. Um, by the way, if you can find it, um, it, uh, cause I saw it was so memorable to me when we were working on lives, you published a story in the New Yorker, um, that is basically, it's like a fairy tale. It's like a kid's, a children's storybook of, of, about, a uh, a man basically like a, a family, someone who's become a father and is trying to raise a family and like that trajectory. Um, and it was just so tied into like all this stuff we were trying to talk about and you articulated a much uh, punchier way. Um, if you can, yeah, if you can look up that story, everybody on, um, maybe it'll be collected at some point, but um, yeah. it should be available on the New Yorker website, I believe. Um, yeah. uh, so maybe two things. I know we're, we want to get to some questions. It's, um, at some point, um, uh, two things, I guess, uh, one more serious than the other, but, you know, this, this book came out during pa the pandemic. And I'm, I'm curious to he hear your, how it, how all this, you know, a, a book being published and, you know, getting this lovely recognition, how <laughs> having all that happen over zoom, how that's been, um, but before that, I, I, I do want to like, you know, so much of what is at the heart of this book, I think is in the last six months has been in the foreground of a conversation and terrible shit that's been going on in this country with um, violence against Asian Americans. And, you know, I don't know how often you have to, you know, talk about this. I mean, you, you wrote a great, a beautiful op-ed um, in the LA Times about it, but you know, how how are you feeling about that? Like in relationship to your book, and um, uh, because I think you, you your 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 profile has great. You are suddenly in this place where you know you can talk about it in a way that I think is really just so meaningful and. Um, uh, persuasive. So I'm just curious how the, all that is, how, how, how it's been for you. Yeah. Thanks for asking about that. And, uh, and I see also the, uh, super on top of it festival 
squad have our, I think linking to the op-ed if anyone wants to check it out. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it's weird, you know, like I'm the last, per- literally I'm the last person who should be speaking for anyone other than myself. And even then I am hesitant to speak for myself often. So, uh, and yet, you no, know, I think, um, for whatever, you know, window, I have some kind of opportunity to, to write or say things, you know, on, whether it's on zoom or op-eds, I feel like, well, I should try. Then the question is like, how, you know, because what substantive knowledge do I actually bring to this other than sort of my personal experience? And then as a writer of weird short stories and occasionally TV. So, um, uh, so that's the lens that I, I try to approach it from, you know, even in that op-ed, I'm yeah. always just, um, you know, it, it is obviously, you know, the, as I write about in the, in the op-ed, the, the sort of the wave of sentiment and the wave of attacks, especially in the Bay Area. I mean, it's, yeah. um, it's incredibly upsetting and, and disturbing. And, and yet there's a part of me that isn't completely shocked by it. You know, yeah. that's what's awful in, in a lot of ways is, is that it seems to be confirming something that was there you know that that maybe um was stoked and um by you know the former president by other public officials who who were stoking it to that end um but they didn't start it they didn't all the kindling was there and so um you know, I, it is, uh, you know, I, I, there, I don't know what to say about it. You know, it, yeah. in a lot of ways it's, it's, I think it was like on the daily show or something where it, maybe it was Ronnie Chang. He was sort of doing his, his version of an op-ed and he's like, this isn't a debate, right? Like, <laughs> it's, this is my opinion. it's what? This is my opinion on this topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no other side to this. Like, don't yeah. commit heinous acts of, you know, violence against people and yeah. also elderly Asian people or any Asian people, but yeah. also people don't do it. And um, I guess the part of me that I have to remember is that one, maybe not everyone thinks that's a problem, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm I'm coming from uh, living in LA, living privileged in, in a socioeconomic sense, in a sense of not worrying a lot about my physical safety. You know, I, I think about my parents, I think about yeah. other relatives, my wife's family. I think about my wife when she goes, you know, if she's running an errand or something, think about what it will be like for my kids. But in general, I'm not driving around Irvine thinking about, well, I haven't been driving anywhere for 15 months, but I'm, I'm not... I'm not looking over my shoulder a whole lot. So, yeah. so it's easy for me to think, do I have to really say something, you know? And yeah. so sometimes stepping out of that bubble, I guess it's like, yeah, you do. Because even if no one's out there advocating for the violence, there may be people who want to either minimize it or who may yeah. think, is this really like trivialize it? I suppose that, yeah. okay, what's, what's the worst? Someone calls you a slur, I guess, you know, is that the same as um, sort of, so many other injustices don't we have other things to worry about and that's again this is all my own sort of internal yeah self-doubt is like what is what why why do i even have to negotiate about this and yet so i i I don't know i'm giving you sort of a picture of i guess the calculus that goes on and like so is it worth saying something Am, am i the one to be saying it probably not but maybe i can you know use whatever temporary platform to amplify someone who does know what they're talking about that's yeah. that's the best i probably could do well i mean i think as fiction writers were i'm more comfortable in in fiction but i think like i don't know um i don't know i i, I interior chinatown just it's it's <laughs> it, you know i'm trying to think of a the metaphor for it, but it, it's, it's, it's kind of like, I think it just like cleared out so much crap. Like, you know, like 
Hercules and the Aegean stables or something. It's just like the, it, I can't remember a book that just like so instantly just like like puts um, a culture under the microscope and just immediately uh, as a way in. And I think I don't know. I it's it's both a perfect book f- for this moment, but I think it I, you know whether you're trained or not, it has I think a, just a really a beautiful, important political aspect of it. I don't know how much you were trying to do that, but it it will last because it's it is also just about stuff like family and stuff. So I think that is the test of a book, and so um, yeah, just the. Um, it just has that bit of bit of glow around it. Um, and, uh, but yeah, has it been okay? Like experiencing all this through zoom, have you actually connected with more people because of it in a weird way or. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, you know, that that's a silver line, you know, that's a unexpected unintended consequence, I guess is I, yeah. definitely easier to, to talk to people and, uh, both geographically and just there's things that um, it's a, it's a little easier, yeah, from the comfort of your house to have. I, I think I'd be scared to go to certain panels or events, you know, in person. I'd just fake an injury or something, but <laughs> I can log on from home, you know. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, well, it's about a quarter to, I don't know if you... Um, yeah, I think we have uh, some uh, questions, Charlie. So um, uh, yeah. I think I forget what we do. What do we do? Yeah, we what, what, we, what we do. Hi, it's Sherilyn again. Um, yeah, okay. I will voice some questions. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, coming in from the audience, um, and we have quite a few. So let's just start with kind of a follow up to what you were just talking about, sort of how interior Chinatown like really nailed it Uh, for Charlie. What is your motive? Was your motivation for writing interior Chinatown and how autobiographical was the story? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It really ties into the last thing Jim was just saying too, you know, in terms of motivation is (laughs) finish the, book that is seven years overdue <laughs> to uh, <laughs> Pantheon books. Uh, I mean, literally I was, it, it kind of ate away at me. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't mean to rub salt in the wound, Jim, but like, I don't think I slept that well for those years. Uh, you, you've been busy doing other stuff. I didn't have that much of an, of an excuse for a lot of those years. Yeah. Um, so the, the motivation was literally like, what do I, what is this story that I can't seem to tell? And it was really in a lot of ways, it started with the story of the old Asian man, old Asian woman, when they were younger, those were, those were that those were the, the kernel of the story that I had before I ever um, figured out how to write it. I just had chunks of like prose that I said, well, this is going to go in something. I don't know what. Yeah. Then interior Chinatown as a kind of concept and title came years in, but once that landed, that's actually when the writing started happening. You know, that yeah. was the key, you know, that was the key. So, but this, the, 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 really the motivation was to, to, to explore the lives of these characters. And as fiction writer, you know, that's ultimately, you know, there's no, for me, there's no like political intent as such. It's, yeah. it comes as a maybe happy, maybe not happy byproduct of like trying to tell a story. And, and really it was, here's the interior subjective life of the background character that didn't get his own story. You know? yeah. and, and he happens to be this Asian guy, but um, I wanted to hear his voice and I wanted to hear his thoughts. And so that was it really. And there is some autobiography. I mean, my, my dad who ended up, you know, both of my parents ended up in Southern California, but they did live in various places in the U S including Mississippi and Alabama. So started with the seed of, you know, fact and kind of layers of fiction were wrapped around it yeah just my the one thing i'll i'll say you know this is familiar but i part of maybe this session with like thinking of my because i think they're just more interesting than i am and so i'd rather write about them i don't know but anyway yeah um i doubt that but i hear you (laughs) 
<laughs> want another question? You sure. want another question? Okay. Um, so this is from Joe who put in two questions. Actually, they're a little similar. So let me try to summarize. Um, how does writing for television differ from writing prose outside of the obvious differences in form? How does writing a novel in screenplay format differ from writing a script for TV? And what are some of the challenges in writing a script that is meant to be read, but not necessarily performed? And there's questions about developing plot and character for prose versus TV freedoms and restrictions of each. So a lot of stuff in there. So whatever you want to pick up. Charlie. I want to hear your Jim's answer though, to, well, I mean, the parts that are relevant to, uh, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot. I can go first or if you want to think. No, the, yeah, I, I guess the first part, um, I don't know. I honestly, I find writing uh, uh, fiction way more difficult in a certain essential sense. Um, sometimes it can be fun, but that's rare. And uh, there's the one thing that I think I, I like, I like writing dialogue. So that does transfer it. And like, that's everything really um, in the, in a, TV scripts. Um, so <laughs> I don't know. I, I go, I'm going to quote William Goldman, who he, uh, he wanted to tell the story of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance kid. And he, he couldn't decide whether to do it as a novel or, a or as a screenplay. He just loved the story. And then he started thinking, he did, he's like, I don't like horses. If I write a novel, I'm going to do all this research on horses. I don't want to do that. So I'll just write a screenplay because you just write horse. <laughs> There's no like, you know, everyone. And then you, um, so that, that kind of laziness is uh, uh, familiar and appealing, I think. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, uh, uh, I would now I want to write a spec called horse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, just a trilogy horse. Uh, I, I agree for me, it's fiction is much harder. Um, and it also has the, uh, the, you know, benefit, but also the drawback of no one's really waiting even your publisher will mostly wait for you you're like yeah. you're not going to get someone breathing whereas there are real deadlines uh, yeah that i'm so uh and you know for me one is really um about like interior i mean not just this book but in interiority and the other it can be, you know, I think like, for instance, Lodge 49 is a very, you know, psychological has, has a lot of dimension to it, but someone has to film something at some point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone has to put the horse in the, in the, in front of the camera. So yeah. uh, not just the horse's thoughts. So I guess that is one part as for like, what is it like trying to adapt this <laughs> thing? Uh, which I'm trying to do right now for um, I'm trying to adapt interior Chinatown as a series. It's, you know, be careful what you wish for is all I can say. <laughs> this was my dream and it is very difficult because I, it's not as if I've made a whole bunch of shows and I know, Oh, this is the baseline of how you make a show. Now add this twist. It's like, Oh, <laughs> how do you do, how do you do the easy thing? And now, easy you know how do you do the incredibly difficult thing of making a show and then on top of that there's this other layer uh i don't i don't actually know yet you know i'm yeah. just gonna figure it out well i sure hope you do please keep us posted thanks can you this is an anonymous question can you talk about your writing habits do you have a routine where does the inspiration come from and i guess this would apply to multiple forms that you work in uh i'll go first on this one jim <laughs> and then i want to hear uh um writing habits 
um, they've changed over the years. I mean, it used to be, uh, I could just take the whole weekend and, you know, lay around and read, wake up really late, take a nap. And that, I don't know, I guess one, I think getting a little older too, just as my kids got older, I just had less real free time and mental space. And then even switching from being a lawyer to TV writer, I've still always had a day job. So the fiction, for instance, always um, has, I don't want to say come last, but it just fits in around the other stuff. But that's okay with me. Like I would set aside, like after I left, you know, after I leave a writer's room, for instance, and I have a block of time where I'm just writing fiction, then I do, I get up in the morning and I try to write, but actual like useful time it, it it's not a lot you know it I, I don't think i i think i sit around for seven hours and then i get all the writing done in half an hour for some reason but yeah. um that that's sort of, i i do try to sit and sit in the chair for a lot of hours every day though yeah yeah i think the one thing i wish someone had told me at a younger age or uh th- that kind of hibernation is like a part of being a writer and that um that could it could last weeks months years where i don't know every writer feels like they're not working hard and falling behind but i i and this is could just be an excuse for laziness but i i do feel like that because i go i can go i've gone months weeks months and years without writing anything like not even really even trying very you know um I've, I've got to maybe a little better at that, but uh, I've I've kind of been of the mindset that if it's if I'm forcing it, it's going to feel if I'm not having fun doing it on some level, it's going to be won't be fun for any a reader. Um, so I do tend to kind of have periods where I'm more productive and I something's going, but those are rare. Um, and what you said, Charlie, about like a real deadline, I mean, like uh, that does, it makes all the difference. And I, there's a part, I don't know how I can institute that, you know, uh, for, for fiction um, in a more stronger way other than like, everyone's very kind, like my agent and all of them, you know, like they're very patient and I kind of wish they weren't. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think, uh i've tried to be more relaxed it's hard but about periods where i'm not doing much and that's okay you're not a monster you know um uh and i try to think of more as hibernation like it's you'll come out at some point and be ready to write the thing that you're going to write um i don't know if that's right or wrong but i think that's kind of what i've kind of settled on because i don't i've never had consistent habits so anyway Do we have a... Okay, yeah, another question. Um, Leslie asks, who are the writers and books uh, that inspire you? Um, I hear Jim Gavin is the second coming of Dennis Johnson. That's what Esquire magazine said. No, this is actually, I mean, I, I've plugged it a lot, but I have to say, if you have not read this collection, it is uh, exquisite is a good word. You know, it's just incredible writing. And if, especially if you, I, I feel like if you've watched Jim's show, you probably have already read it, but I don't know. You, sh- you definitely, it feels like not the prequel, but from the same mind uh, that created, are they part of the same multiverse? Is that, <laughs> uh, are all these characters in the lodge multiverse? Yes. Okay. That will definitely be lucrative someday. So I'll say, yeah. <laughs> Um, now you have to say me, Jim. No, I want to hear right, actually well, who <laughs> we shook on this before. Um, no, I mean, I, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think, um, yeah, this is always a, a, a strange question. It's kind of like what I'm, what, what, what did I read that was formative and what am I kind of reading and enjoying now? And they're very different. I mean, mm-hmm. I think in my twenties, I was probably reading more kind of intellectual, Big, you know the big the big books um 
And I think I'm more interested in kind of smaller character novels uh, now. Um, um, whether I'm going to be able to um, remember any, I will say, maybe just I'll say this for like both of us, like the books, you know, we talked a lot about for Lodge as kind of inspirational. Um, uh, Borges, I think, is like kind of the the really guiding star of, of the show. Um, and for me personally, Joyce as well. I think there's like a, we buried, a, you know, Ulysses in there pretty deep. Um, it, and I think those two writers is the, uh, one, one just is very granular and, gets dirt under his nails with just like life and reality. And the other is this metaphysical genius who reckons with time in ways that are just are infinitely uh, relatable. And, and so, I don't know, I think uh, those are some of my favorite moments in, is when we were kind of talking about books and writers we love. Cause I, the show I think is, was way more inspired by, my books than any type than any other uh, movies or per se. Um, although, you know, we had those influences as well. Okay, great. Um, we had a, a comment that's come up in chat in a couple of places about sustaining the creative energy to write when you've also been to write quote creatively, not as if you're writing during the day is not creative, but you know, you're writing all day in one form and then you come home and you want to write the next form the other the book as opposed to the tv writing all day or whatever it might be so how do you sustain the creative energy for so many hours uh for me it i mean i won't lie there are days where it's a grind most days it it's um not pleasurable <laughs> It's, it's rarely pleasurable, but yet I find myself doing it and I do it even when it's not, you know, it's not my livelihood. You know, for a lot of years, I had no idea what that any sort of anyone would actually read it. You know, I mean, there are things I wrote before I knew they'd be published and even now they're so for me, I, I guess it's almost a compulsion. I mean, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know why I do it. I actually, you know, it's, it's, it often comes at the expense of time with family and friends. It, it, it comes at the, it just feels like uh, I have to, but I wish I could be more articulate about that. Cause, but maybe if I could be more articulate, I would stop doing it. I don't know. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, most of my bad jobs at work, I was like, it didn't require, I wasn't writing. So I, I felt like I did have a little bit, I think I maybe, I don't know, consciously or something was like, kind of was more willing. Like I took a lot of weird jobs and to maybe keep a little bit for myself. Um, but that's hard to do. I, I would say like the, the times where I, when I, you know, working full time and trying to write, I think um, having a, a very small goal is seems important like it's you you should know the novel if you're writing a novel it's going to take you years and you just you know if you can get out a paragraph in a week like i, I think that's <laughs> you're doing great you know <laughs> honestly seriously so yeah no that's a really good point i did the math and in interior chinatown if i had written 20 words a day for those years I would have finished the book the same amount of time. <laughs> so you're not wrong. There you go. The 20 words, a day. if you can 20 words a day, it's the Charlie, you system. Seven years. You'll have a very short novel. <laughs> <laughs> Solid novella, you know? So one last question, maybe for running out of time from the audience. And then, you know, Jim, if you have any other questions or you guys have last comments, um, Jung, J U N G asks, how have things changed? changed over the years for better or for worse for Asian American writers in the literary publishing industries. I'd like to answer this. Um, yeah. Let me no. Go ahead, Tron. Um, no, please. Uh, it um, in, in liter, I don't, you know, 
I guess I published my first book like 15 years ago. Um, I do think that like when you, I read the pages of the, you know, New York times book review, or I look at blogs, I look at, you know, and I look at festival lineups, it looks different than it did when I was first starting to read 20 years ago, for sure. Um, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's really, it's, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know how much personal experience I have, I guess in that time, I've also, I've also felt like, I mean, maybe there's a reason why interior Chinatown was my fourth book. Maybe I didn't feel like I knew how to write it or that it would have any kind of reception when I was first starting out, you know? And so, um, that's, that's really all I can think about is that it, it feels like in some sense, the conversation has broadened and there's more room for a story and points of view, um, and just weird, really weird books like interior Chinatown. Uh, so I'm really like grateful for that. What about you, Jim, as an Asian American writer, have have you felt like (laughs) things have gotten better for you? Infinitely. Um, I will just say that it is a hundred percent true of like what you're saying as far as like, who like in book reviews and stuff like that it it is it is different and and i think enough progress has been made and we should stop it just generally. So, that's true you heard it here jim gavin <laughs> yeah. quote wait, wait, don't quote. yeah yeah well we had a lot of other questions so apologies to everyone who uh wrote in questions uh keep reading charlie and hopefully lodge 49 will come back there were some questions about that like what would have happened if it had continued or is there a way we can bring it back (laughs) so i don't know any words on that and then we will truly stop all we need is 40 million dollars so you guys want to do a uh no i mean i i i um there's i mean there's nothing happening uh, that we tried very hard um, and it's a, a bummer. Um, I, people are still finding the show on Hulu and in the end, that'll be it. Like if, if enough people start watching it, then some executive somewhere might, but um, yeah, it's mm-hmm. been very hard for everyone involved with the show. It, it sucks, but you know, um, I, I wouldn't want to, as far as the story, I don't, I don't have any interest in finishing it without the cast in some way, because they are the show. It's, it's, um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I will say I have some hope, but it's, it's kind of beyond, you know, me and, you know, other, you know, other people involved the show. Um, it doesn't mean it like it can't happen, but it's 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 going to be very difficult. The show did find a way to survive miraculously and just be made in a miraculous way. So I, I don't discount the possibility, um, and I hope we can someday. But uh, it's hard. I don't have good news, which just, just makes me sad. Um, but maybe someday. Yeah. Terrific. Well, thank you both. Um, I guess I should. Uh come on camera and close us out unless yeah. uh, you guys have any, whoops, I've moved around here. Any other last, last words of wisdom? Um, go ahead, Joe. Oh, no, I was, you know, just going to also throw my hat and five bucks in the ring for Lodge 49 season three. Uh, <laughs> so we got it restarted. There we go. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, this would be incredible. We still have Jim. This is what I want to say to the Lodge fans out there. We still have Jim's mind, and he will write many other things that will uh, be as good or better. Or not. We'll see. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, I, I want to thank everyone who uh, is working on the, 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 the festival because this is a real treat i love it's been great talking with charlie and um i just really appreciate all the work you guys are putting in making this happening uh during a very weird time and i look forward to the to doing it in person at some point 
and attending. That will be. And it. thank you to thank you to everyone who uh, tuned in. Yeah, thank you all. It's really a pleasure, and thanks for all the questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but yeah, uh, really appreciate well, it. Read your next books. Watch your yeah. next shows. So we look forward to that. Mm-hmm.